Welcome to another episode of uh, National Team uh, Character Development and Leadership Show, guys. Um, got a really special gr- uh, crew here. Uh, it's actually the crew from the Hera Mission 17. It's a very special event for our audience, and so uh, we're looking forward to having these discussions today. Uh, this is the first time uh, this this team has been reunited since their mission um, got De- delayed or however you want to say it when the uh, hurricane uh, Harvey hit them in 2017 they were doing their their NASA Hera mission and now we're reunited to talk about what uh, what was going on there in their confinement situations while everybody's stuck at home being confined right now uh, we have uh, Shelly Canaris with us Paul Haugen Reinhold Povolitis and Rick Adante, who's, uh, I think a lot of you know Rick. Um, HERA stands for the Human Exploration Research Analog. and represents NASA's largest, longest-running psychological study of humans in isolation and confinement. So that's what we're dealing with right now is some isolation, some confinement. It's a psychological study um, prepara- preparing our astronauts to uh, take uh, space flights up into Mars and beyond. Um, It's a mission uh, that has four crew members that are in confinement that live on the ground in NASA space station in the Johnson space station for up to 45 days. Um, It has been going on for six years. It studies psychological impacts of individual crew members selected for astronaut like characteristics and they study team cohesion, team dynamics, as well as medicine, biology, nutrition, exercise, physiology, botany, and operations that impact crew members in this analog space travel. So uh, a lot of things that we, we talk talk about on this show is uh, teamwork, team cohesion, dynamics, uh, how we can get along better, how we can get more accomplished. So I think this is a really uh, great topic. Um, only HERA missions have been conducted with four people since uh, 2014, and this was the 14th mission. Um, and this mission was cut short. Normally, it's uh, 45 days in isolation. They were cut short because of the the Harvey uh, hurricane, and I'm going to let them tell you guys a little bit more about it. But before I do that, I want to just uh, kind of go through everyone's bio here. Um, the commander of the mission um, was Dr. Paul uh, Haugen who is a lead engineer um, for Landstat 9 with the U.S. Geological Survey, which is a major new satellite being prepared for launched in Earth's orbit soon. He grew up in Minnesota. We got a lot of Greco wrestlers up there. Uh, uh-huh. Has a Ph.D. in biomedical engineering from Rice University and spent many years as a test flight engineer for NASA, flying the T-23 jets with astronauts and leading the modernization of the glass cockpit updates. He was an operational engineer for NASA human research uh, program and was a conductor of this mission. Reinhold, uh, we've met Reinhold, we've had him on a show and I'll even get a link up to that show, Um, was a flight engineer for Hera. Uh, 14. Reinhold is a research engineer on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter at Arizona State. Uh, Colton Schultz, one of our uh, elite athletes, now is uh, an an, uh, an athlete and student at university at the Arizona State University now. So uh, we got some connections there. Which is uh, which satellites the uh, orbits of the moon takes millions of high resolution uh, photographs and digitally reconstructs to make new discoveries about geology and lunar surface that he has published in the world's top journals, such as uh, Nature. Reinhold holds master degrees in material science, engineering, certificates in nuclear power engineering, uh, collegiate rower while at the University of Arizona. Uh, Reinhold is fluent in Russia and recently competed, completed his four-month mission uh, for the for the NASA in isolation confinement with Russian Russian cosmonauts <laughs> in Moscow, and in his free time builds motorcycles from scratch in his living room. Uh, I mean, this is this crew is amazing. Um, Dr. Shelley, uh, she was a uh, 
mission specialist uh, for the Hera mission and is an engineer for the Institute of Defense, analyzes uh, at the Pentagon. She uh, earned her PhD in engineering science at the University of Oxford as a Marshall Scholar and a National Science uh, Foundation Fellow each of which are very high honors, uh, unbelievable, on a bachelor's in science and engineering, um, computer science at MIT with minors in biomedical engineering and Spanish uh, when not traveling the world to remote military bases. She also serves as a brew critic for the Washington Post. That is uh, one of <laughs> one of my favorite hobbies as well, Shelley. So, uh, and uh, Rick, we 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 know Rick, but we're going to uh, introduce him here. Uh, he's the co-host of the the Leadership and Character Development Show, and uh, he's also the uh, psychological professor at Cal State, uh, where he's the director of the EEG Research Lab. Um, earned his PhD in neuroscience from UC Davis, with a BA in psychology from the College of New Jersey. He was a, a four-time NCAA wrestler as a Division III walk-on, um, was on the mission, was an on, um, excuse me, was the other mission specialist for HERA mission, and then later principal investigated scientific studies of astronaut cognitions in confinement of NASA NEMO mission as astronauts lived under sea laboratory of the Florida coast. I mean, we've got so many credentials here and so many wise people. Uh, I'm going to just turn it over to you guys to let me tell me about uh, kind of what you learned about confinement and how we can do better while we are confined. Thanks, Matt. That's uh, too, too hard to follow, but uh, I didn't know you were a beer critic for the Washington Post show. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's one thing we didn't have in our mission was any beer or any alcohol at all. Um, and I am actually trying to follow that. And so throughout my confined isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic, I have decided to go completely dry. So uh, no alcohol whatsoever. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I need some tips and tricks from you for that, too. So before I knew we were being confined, uh, I, I, I gave up coffee and alcohol. Lent because mm -hmm. I figured that I would crack from one of them. So I yeah. did. <laughs> and uh, the alcohol is really easy to give up. Like it's yeah. no big deal, but the coffee is, is killing me. I mean, I, I, I already caved today. <laughs> um, well, so I also I, converted back to hair rules for that. So I'm only allowing myself one cup of coffee, uh, not closer than 12 hours before bedtime, which was one of the rules that we had to live with during our is, isolation. So is it the is it the instant coffee? No, thank goodness. <laughs> you doing that cowboy coffee like uh, like Paul had a yeah. couple days old? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, for, for, for the audience listening, this is a really special event for us as, as crew members because this is the first time we've been back together since we had an emergency abort from the Hurricane Harvey. And so uh, it's like being back together with the family and getting the band back together. So it's great to see you guys. Thank you guys so yeah. much for, for yeah, coming for on the sure. show. Um, you know, so maybe that's a good place to start. Like Shelly, you mentioned like the coffee and the alcohol and the rationing, like maybe you can share with, uh, you know, the viewers, what is it that we were doing in the Herod mission? Like what were the, the limitations and impositions in terms of sleep and food and, and access to these things and, and what were we doing? Why were we doing it? And what was some of the challenges? Sure. So what NASA wanted to better understand is how to keep astronaut-like people happy and healthy on a long-duration space voyage. And astronauts are too busy to um, experiment on. And so they took people like us who have um, degrees in engineering and science and uh, roughly the same age as astronaut, and they pulled us from different parts of the U.S. and shut us up in a tin can for what was supposed to be six weeks. Um, and we made it through uh, just over the third, the end of the third week before the hurricane hit. And so what they asked us to do was to live our life as though we were on a mission to a far off distant asteroid. And so on the very first uh, day, day one, they simulated our liftoff. 
Um, I think you guys can remember the woofers underneath that made it sound as though the rockets were taking off and uh, outside of our quote unquote window, which was an LCD screen, you would see the earth getting farther and farther away. And, um, and then our comms link to mission control actually got more and more delayed the farther we got out. So at first it was instant. We would get on the radio and call mission command and they would immediately respond. But the farther and farther our mission went out, we would do a radio transmission and it would take a few minutes for the response to come back uh, because that's how long it would actually take if you were on a real mission going that far out. And so, during the mission, they kept us busy with the same kind of events that astronauts would have to do on their mission. So um, we had a schedule that they would upload to our iPads every day. And that schedule was scheduled to five minute increments that mission control had decided how we were gonna plan out our lives. And, um, and so we did a lot of different things. And uh, one of the, the main things that they were looking for was how we you know, dealt with stress, um, both the stresses of living in confined isolation with each other, um, but also they would manufacture stress for us. So they would manufacture things like, um, you know, uh, uh, a tank exploding and we would have to figure out like why that happened and fix it. Or they would manufacture things like, um, you know, a siren would go off because there was a radiation leak. And so we would have to figure out where the source of the radiation leak was. And our particular set of experiments was to look to see how people uh, responded to uh, mild chronic sleep deprivation. So they limited the hours that we were even allowed to lay down in our bunks. So we were only allowed um, to lay down for what was it? Five hours a night, I think it was. During yeah, the it was, yep, we could go up in the bunks at 2 a.m. and then they would wake us at 7 a.m. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if, if you were lucky, you were able to fall asleep right away. And so you would get, you know, four hours and 55 minutes of sleep each night. <laughs> but if not, then, uh, then, you know, you ended up having to deal with some uh, sleep deprivation. And so, you know, as part of that, they really wanted to limit the amount of caffeine that we ingested. Um, and so we were only allowed to have a very small amount of caffeine each day and not within 12 hours of bedtime. Um, and uh, so I've decided I'm going to try to live my life during this COVID-19 pandemic using those same rules. So I only allow myself one cup of coffee um, each morning, uh, not before noon. And then, um, yeah, then no alcohol and, uh, you know, mm. ration, ration food also. Uh, Are you doing the, doing the sleep, sleep dip, Shelly? I am not doing the sleep <laughs> dip. I am not. And, and I'm also letting myself exercise every day because one of the things <laughs> that they did to us, which I think we all had a hard time with, was they limited, I think we were in the arm of the study where we had um, less exercise than, than normal. So we were only allowed to exercise for 30 minutes every other day. And, uh, and so I'm definitely not speaking to that. I mean, I think that was one of the interesting parts that was difficult, that it wasn't just confinement for us. And I think a lot of people don't understand that at times, that they think we were in there kind of like jail where you can just read a book the whole day. But we were working the full time while not being able to sleep and then also having to ration food and not having coffee. That changes our attitudes. It changes you know, our moods you know, as we're cranky and, and whatnot. And then we've got to get along with everybody. And, and we're not allowed to exercise either, which also changes our moods. And it really makes it hard. And it's that's one of the reasons I thought this would be such an interesting conversation to have is because this isn't all that different from what a lot of people might be experiencing now in confinement where, um, you know, they might be in an apartment building where there's no real, like, nature park to go out and, and walk around in or exercise in or, you know, coffee stocks that they have in the, in the building or uh, that I have accessible to and, and you know, I think, you know, you guys have a lot of wisdom collectively to share of how did you, how do you manage that? What were some of the challenges that you found yourself or our team dealing with? And then what are some ways you came, you know, came, came away with being able to, to navigate that successfully? And, and Reinhold, you're like freaking superstar. You did four months in Russia, <laughs> locked up, 
I mean, that's incredible. And what was that like for you guys? Uh, similar to here in a lot of ways, um, although we had a lot more space and uh, fewer restrictions in terms of caffeine um, and uh, sleep. So a little more freedom in that sense. Uh, but the confinement itself was very similar. Um, and the challenges we faced were very similar. And then that on top of that, the cultural barriers, um, you know, for Americans, we kind of understand each other's cultures uh, right away, even though we're from different parts of the country. Uh, but when you start mixing in different nationalities, it, it gets a little more complicated. So adjusting to that over the span of four months um, was challenging at times, but we, we figured it out. And, and you know, one of the qualities I think a lot of people like that have is that they're able to adjust easily to that sort of thing. So um, wasn't so bad. Um, I will say that you know, I've noticed that I pay a lot more attention to how much toilet paper I use nowadays, <laughs> even than I did in Hera. <laughs> you know, I, I felt like we had an ample supply in, in Hera, but uh, I kind of question myself now. Like, I don't know. I think maybe you know, I have to go outside and, and brave that world to, to find toilet paper. <laughs> There's always but everything else. Uh, yeah. Everything else, um, as far as the rationing and everything, uh, there were some lessons to be learned from from Hera and from any of those isolation studies where you learn to live with as, as much as you have or even less if you can. And then um, if more is provided to you uh, by surprise or by opportunity, then you take advantage of that and, and hopefully save it or use it wisely. That's true. I, I've actually... Um during this pandemic, I've really started to uh, have a new respect and appreciation for mission control that we had during our experiment because mission control provided all of that for us. Um, you know, they made sure that we had everything we needed in the hab before we entered it. And so, you know, when I was doing my massive grocery shop right when this whole thing started, I had to stop and think, well, how long is this going to last? And how, how many meals is that? Like, how, many, how, how much oatmeal should I buy? How many rolls of toilet paper? And I just really wanted a mission control to do that for me. <laughs> because, you know, I really realized how much planning they went into to think about all of the things that we would need during that. Yeah, it's impressive. And I mean, I, so Paul, you were the commander of our mission and you were... The person that was responsible for really doing the most interfacing with mission controls. So for people who aren't uh, aware of the structure that we use, there's a mission control center, which is our only contact to the outside world. Uh, we don't have Instagram, Facebook, email, phone, whatever. And, you know, Paul being the commander, you know, he took the leadership position to, to do that communication on our behalf, uh, back and forth between us and them. And one of the things that is a real psychological phenomenon that can occur both in space, but also on the ground and in regular situations is that us versus them phenomena, where crews can sometimes feel conflict with mission control and, and vice versa. And that might be something that people even might be feeling confined now, which is like either they might not know what's happening from the leaders or the people outside or even within the, they're in their how, homes or whatnot there might have that phenomena occur, but it, it's kind of a perception, right? It's not always real. Like, how did you manage that representing us through to mission control? And how, how did you find yourself kind of guiding through those communications during times when, you know, all the time just blurs and we feel like we're in there for months <laughs> and months? Uh, I, I mean, you know, there was a couple key things, I guess. Um, one was, I mean, just, you know, normal, courteousness and politeness you know that I think that goes a long ways in in uh, making sure that you know even if there was a contentious topic or whatever uh, making sure that you know you get your point across but you know keeping it in a professional and courteous manner um, another key point I think was um, making sure that the message that got across was us as a team so it wasn't you know this person or this per it was you know a, a collective team opinion and this was our position on x y or z <clears throat> um so it, it kept us unified 
didn't single anyone out. Um, and it also, I think, I, I think that helped um, with the communications with Mission Control. You know, it was also important, I think, to to try to keep Mission Control in our team as much as possible. I mean, some of it just, you know, with the circumstances and the delayed calm, it just doesn't work out all the time. But but as much as we could, I mean, we were um, trying to joke around quite a bit with Mission Control and, and banter back and forth. Part of it, I suppose, was that was our only outside uh, communication. Part of it was, you know, keeping them as part of the team, I think, and, and that was a, a big point. And actually, that was that was kind of a contentious point, I would say, too. I don't know if you guys remember, you know, we were kind of bantering back and forth with them about uh, delivering us pizza or something like that. And we kind of got in trouble a little bit and was told to knock it off. And for me, at least, that was kind of a, you know, I think all of us was kind of a downer. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was pretty disappointing, you know, and it was kind of a drag on us for a couple of days, I would say, because because we were trying to keep this upbeat attitude and keep this banter going and and have fun with it. And, and, uh, you know, so that was kind of a downer. I don't know what, what you three thought about that, but. Yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of strange at first. It felt like they were changing attitudes throughout the course of a mission. And I, I don't know if that yeah. was part of the study as well as how do we, how does the crew react if we are neutral if we're positive, if we're maybe a little bit off-putting. Um, and I don't know if, if I picked up on that or if it was just my own emotions changing <laughs> at times, uh, but it, it felt like there was, there was a difference. I, I think that was not intentional. I mean, you know, I think for whatever reason, they felt that, that uh, you know, our banter back and forth was, was not appropriate necessarily. Too much. But, but it wasn't it wasn't a point of of uh purposely trying to antagonize us yeah. i think in past missions it had been i mean that had been a point but i think that's why i thought of not. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i think I, I remember that like reinhold you had a, a good thing that you got i think you got your wrist slapped pretty good on uh which we oh, thought boy. was hilarious <laughs> um well you so they have cameras on us it's like big brother 24 7 and we know somebody's paid to watch the camera and you set up a thing where you had like <laughs> like a uh, piece of paper after piece of paper you would you wrote out like one that's one word per line oh, yeah. to uh what was it uh you rickrolled them one 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 word at a time <laughs> oh, yeah maybe i did <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, they didn't get they, they didn't get so happy about that. But you know, I think that's something that was like it made the mission really special to me to be a part of as a teammate for you guys. Is like we had a really good vibe of like making sure we had good banter and fun. Yeah, and that's something that makes a good team. And I think it helps to pass the time, especially like yeah, we don't know when this confinement now is going to end. We don't know how much food to buy in preparation for that, and we don't know how long we have to stretch our expectations out of like that sort of discipline and I don't know what it was like for you guys in the mission but like for for me time just kind of stopped and got weird like a day felt like a week and a week felt like a month and I didn't it was hard to really gauge how much longer we really have to go and having a good attitude with like you guys had such good jokes it just felt like we were at summer camp with friends <laughs> Well, that's, you know, and, and one of the things that I think Hera taught me was that, you know, you, you've got to appreciate the moment when you have it because you never know how long you're going to have. I mean, um, so, you know, we were supposed to have 45 days in there and I was looking forward to, you know, that last week where yeah. all the hard part would be done and we could just like sit around the proverbial campfire and just, you know, shoot the fat and and just feel that great sense of accomplishment. I was like really looking forward to that. And, um, but thinking like, oh my God, these middle weeks, I'm sleep deprived and I'm tired. And, you know, if only this part was over and we could get to the fun stuff. But unfortunately with the hurricane, we never got to get to that point. And so coming out, it made me realize, you know, how important it was to not wish your time away and, and to appreciate every moment you have, even if it seems like that moment is stressful. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do right now where 
I'm thinking about, oh my God, I can't wait till I can, you know, get back to see my friends and, you know, hanging out with my family members and, and traveling because I love to travel and all these things that I can't wait to do again. But um, I'm trying to just think about appreciating this time that I do have because you never know how long you're going to have that. So that was like one of the big takeaway moments that the hurricane taught me. Yeah, Matt, talk, Matt talks a lo- about that a lot. And we, we had a show we did a few a week or so ago where, you know, we talked about some of the good parts about this, where I think Matt's up on the coast in Oregon, somewhere oh, yeah. beautiful and remote and having time to reconnect to nature and, and you know, decompress and, and have not isolation, but solitude with himself or just close ones. And like society's kind of in a spot where maybe we need that and maybe a break <laughs> from the energy drinks and the, you know, the, the go, go, go. But like, it's really hard to balance that, right? It just feels, it feels weird because it's different uh, than what we're used to. We're, we're out of our routines. And I mean, I heard Shelly say, you know, like staying to a routine helps, um, helps with the, even in this time. And certainly you guys had five minute increments when you were on that mission. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I take athletes overseas, a lot of this stuff sounds very similar because we'll go on a trip uh, overseas and we don't know how many athletes are going to show up. We don't know what caliber sometimes Um, we don't know what the training schedule is going to be like. And they're asking me and I'm like, when we get there, I'll, I'll let you know, I'm going to meet with, with the coaches and we're going to figure this stuff out. But it's like, we want information now. We want it. <laughs> what, what do you know right now? It's like, sometimes it's just be patient. The information is going to come. And it sounds like you guys had a lot of that type of stuff where they didn't tell you necessarily what was next. They were just like, this is the mission. Um, and you kind of got details as they came. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? A little both. A little both. Yeah. I think they'd update our, they'd, they pushed the schedules to our iPads, I think in like one week chunks, was that it? So we could see ahead what we were, what was on our schedule for the next week, but we wouldn't know past that. And, um, but also just because it was on our schedule doesn't mean it was going to happen because they would throw curveballs at us. And, you know, you just had to, just had to deal. Yeah, I, I mean, I will we were say, overloaded. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Rick. Oh, no, I was just going to say the schedule is just a list of stuff that didn't happen sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, I mean, the keeping busy, though, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but the days flew by. I mean, we were working 19-hour work days, essentially, and I could not believe when that, you know, it was 11 o'clock at night and we were getting ready to eat supper already. And, it, I mean, it felt like it was about, Three thirty in the afternoon, and the, the time—I mean, it really made the time fly by because we kept so busy, and it was just with a lot of times it was just mundane tasks and you know keeping busy with this and then moving on to that and you know it was a, uh, but it really made the time and and the weeks go by fast. I thought I mean I couldn't believe that we were at day twenty three or whatever it was. I mean it was really went by fast. I thought. I don't know. What did you think, Ryan, holding your four-month escapade? <laughs> uh, there are times when it, it seemed to drag on a little bit, but it was a um, similar situation. You just you wake up one day and it's you have a week to go, and you're like, "What? Uh, we've been in <laughs> here for almost four months already. Are you uh-huh. serious? Um, how do you guys feel about your current situation? Do you feel like the days fly by while you're in?" I guess quarantine for lack of a better term or do they drag on? I don't know what day it is. What did you say, Rick? I said, I don't know what day it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I do today. I know today's Monday because we started a new quarter in our, in, in our academic school. So I, I had to be on top, but we've had spring break the last <laughs> week or so or sometime. And mm. it just, it was like the mission. It was just, it, it, they don't the days don't have names they just have numbers and i was like eh. i mean I don't know. for me yeah i i um i feel like it's going by pretty fast because i guess again i'm trying to live hair alike and so i'm just trying to 
schedule a lot of things for myself just to keep busy. And not that I necessarily do everything that I set out to do, but I, I, one of the things that really helped me at Hera was just always having a goal, always having like three goals ahead of me at any one time. And, you know, in Hera, they, in Hera, they over schedule you. So sometimes it, it often it's hard to, you're, you're not going to accomplish everything that they have on your schedule. You're just not going to get to it all. But it was nice to see it there. Like you were never bored in Hera because there's always two or three more things you had to do. And so, you know, I am, um, I'm, I'm working from home and my company has not slowed down. And so, you know, all of my meetings are now telecons. And so, you know, I put in eight hours a day today before we, you know, did our, before we got online here. And then, um, and then, you know, stuff to do at my free time, like, so I'm trying to exercise. So I feel like now I have no excuse to not exercise every day, which is great. And then, you know, I have all these other projects that I, you know, things I want to do around the house or, um, you know, I've gotten out my sewing machine so I can start, I, I've been making um, masks for my ER physician neighbor uh, to take to the hospital. And, you know, so I have like this little daily quota of how many I'm going to make each night. And so I've been, um, I've been actually really busy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and that helps for me. Um, but although I have to admit this weekend, I did nothing. I laid on my sofa with my cats and read books and that was all I did. I did absolutely nothing else. And so, uh, because it was the weekend and I could. Um, so I think for me, I'd like having that schedule laid out of two or three additional things I need to, I, I can do at any given time. But then at the same time, I also give myself permission to not do them. <laughs> but just knowing that they're there, it has, is, is helpful to me. Yeah, I think that's that's something I've found really helpful that I've been thinking about a lot during these times. Um, I tell students to, to do what you did, which is to, to take the actual weekends. Because it's really hard when people are working at home to think that that means you never stop working. And yeah. you, to lose that continuity in that regard, um, you know, that really helped, I think, in our mission because our days were very long and we did a lot of work every day. And to have those weekends, we were never really off, off, but the weekends were very, very much lighter. Yeah. And I think that really helped to reset um, a lot because because we're pretty tired at the end of those days. And I thought that was helpful for the team too. So it's like you know when people are at home now, they have family members and this and that. Like you just keep working the same way through. It's like they're gonna you're gonna start getting on people's nerves and and it's gonna start causing conflict in inside. And that breaks are important. I can I can see that. There's plenty of things to do, even though I'm not working directly with athletes. I mean, we're still communicating very frequently. We're uh, all our meetings are on Zoom and com, you know communicating with the office. But I catch myself just kind of nine o'clock, and it's like, wait, I'm still working. <laughs> it's nine o'clock, and I haven't even you know taken a sauna yet, or you know taken a break, and um, I can see how that could grind on family members and, but it, it's like you, you've got all this extra time and, and so we're busy um, and, and we want to stay productive. Right. So um, yeah. How, how is that different? Did you have weekends uh, on, on the mission? Was there such a thing? I would say yes. And no. I mean, they were supposed to be a little bit slower, but I, I think Saturdays actually were, you know, fairly busy and yeah. Sundays I, I would say were slower but there was still you know definite tasks and stuff that needed to be done and every day and stuff so um like on Sundays we had to clean you know, yeah yeah we had to do so you know it wasn't like our time off was spent you know just doing whatever we wanted but you know cleaning cleaning the bathroom and scrubbing the toilet and stuff like that um we were allotted a uh, what it was it eight hours of sleep on weekend yeah. days yeah so yeah. that's that's one way it was easier to tell that it was a weekend uh -huh. um, was that you were hopefully you got a couple extra hours of sleep <laughs> that was great yeah yeah, yeah and you guys... reaction times always were much better on Monday mornings <laughs> <laughs> yeah eight hours of sleep it was great yeah. <clears throat> yeah you guys got me thinking about it 
couple things like that. Like I bet know, so. <laughs> when well, yeah, well, when 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 we were talking about the us versus them phenomena, like, and when Matt was talking about like, going overseas and guys want information and a plan, really detailed, like, you know, one of the in, in managing that, you know, I remember Paul, you talked me off the ledge one time. When I was really frustrated, there was like a, a, a an experiment we were doing. Well, we weren't doing. They were doing an experiment on us, and it like failed or struggled with something, and it really, really set me off about something I was bothered by, and uh, you know, and it was just I was having a bad time, bad bad day or something, and I was ready to, I was ready to tee off about that researchers project and. <laughs> You know, you you really pulled me back from the ledge because you. I think your leadership style was so good about it, and you you saw what was going wrong for me, and instead you said, you know, somebody, I'm, I'll never forget it. You said, you know, somebody probably spent years working on that for their thesis to get it ready, and it probably just had a goof up, and like this is going to be a really hard day for them when they find out that it didn't go as they planned and like you like diffused a bomb <laughs> <laughs> you know you were like i was like you know what yeah paul he's right like that's right <laughs> and and that perspective change is really important and you know um and that was helpful you know like that 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 kind of information i found was you know you were a, a, attentive to to what crew members needed at that time you know like that's that's helpful um and when shelly was mentioning the cleaning on sundays like i found that was some of my favorite times because i was so you know essentially tired by the end of the week you're kind of burned out from a long week of work and when i had the chance to just put music on and just go clean and just disappear into that world of just doing that to me that was very cathartic and I, I really like that. And, and I think it helped set the next week off in the right way because when you work so much, things do get in disarray, especially now when people are working at home in the house, your house is your workstation. And it's like, to me, that was a really important thing that we did to, to maintain kind of our, our, not just our sanity, but our sanitation. <laughs> uh, I agree. And I think that's, that's also something I'm trying to do. Like, I feel like my house has never been tidier um because i've been trying to well sort of been tidier but it's never been dirtier either like everything is like ordered but i'm rationing my cleaning supplies so <laughs> sometimes i look at my floor and i'm like okay that's vacuumed but i really need to mop but i really don't want to use my mopping pad like you know so but it's true i think you know something that is helpful to me during this pandemic is um you know keeping things tidy um, cause by the, I, I live in a, I live in a high rise apartment building. So I have a, I live in a very small space. It's probably the size of Hera, although there's only me in it, as opposed to all of you as well. Um, <laughs> me and my cats, you know, um, but, but it's still pretty small. And, uh, and you know, I, so, so my world is very small. And so it's just nice to keep things orderly. And then another thing, I was just joking with my friend about how, like, you gotta, you gotta take a shower every day and put on like regular clothes, you know, and comb your hair. Um, and, and, and then you, you know, you sit down in front of your computer every day and you feel like you've gone to work. And, uh, so that's something that I'm all, also trying to do is just like maintain that sort of like personal discipline because at least it really helps me. How important was that exercise time when you only had 30 minutes? Um, and, and what, what kind of different exercises you do? Because I, there's a lot of people that are home right now and looking to stay fit, stay, mm. you know, keep body moving. So, I mean, what confined space, very little equipment. W what did you guys do? Well, what did we have? We alternated between cardio yeah. sessions and I guess you could call them strength. They had, I don't know, I forget how you call it, but the little dumbbell rack there. Um, did we, I don't think we had bands, but you were able no. to do some push-ups and whatnot there. And, um, yeah, half an hour. Uh, and what was it every other day, right? Oh, we skipped yeah. Yeah. And so yep. that was our most precious time, I think, like 
we would make sure we did everything else so that we had the full 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And everything else, so if you if you wanted to do a couple push-ups uh, throughout the day to sort of keep yourself awake, that wasn't necessarily frowned upon or restricted, but uh, anything more wasn't allowed. So you couldn't spend your free time doing push-ups or curls or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of the challenges, Matt, I think, is the exercise is really helpful to us to stay awake. And like Shelly said, I think it's a it's an enormous catharsis that I think we all look forward to with, like, sacrosanct uh, attention. But, like, one of the difficulties is that they actually didn't allow us to do it very often. So we could only exercise once every other day for 30 minutes. And then each of those every other days, we had to alternate cardio versus weights, like Reinhold said. So it was pretty minimal. And the idea was that they didn't want – so when you exercise, it actually gets you more alert and awake. And they didn't want that to interfere with the sleep deprivation element. Um, and so it was – to me, the exercise was certainly amazing. It was a great opportunity. But because it was so limited, it was actually a bigger challenge to not do it as well. And it, it – did they also limit the amount, like the exertion? Like yeah, uh, that's what I was just gonna say. We had a heart rate. We were wearing polar monitors, and um, and for our cardio days, they would actually um, we had to keep our heart rate below a certain uh, level that was based upon our age, and so and it wasn't very high at all, you know. So it wasn't like you could really go to town and work up a hard sweat either reminded me when we did our exercise Matt it was very much in a teamwork side because when Shelly said it was like a very special time that everybody really valued it's because it was that sort of sanctuary time that you had carved out to do your thing and you had a teammate there who basically looked after you and they had to basically watch to make sure you, if you got in trouble or did something unsafe or you got hurt or something but they were on the clock they made sure people didn't interrupt you they were they were your wingman and like it was definitely a team-based thing where like if somebody needed so Shelly and I were teamed up a lot and if somebody needed Shelly for something and they came up the elevator I'd be like no like she's she's busy like can I take a message <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like yeah. you know because it was really important so if people are cooped up that they can carve out that time to do it it matters and I know you know Reinhold was kind of a rock star we had a uh, an exercise bike and Reinhold beat it like a rug <laughs> i think you broke it <laughs> it was yeah. right right on the limit of that heart rate i think most of the time <laughs> i think i don't think oh, you rick were reporting hard... <laughs> rick had some interesting uh uh exercise routines too and i think <laughs> the thing i wanted to say about it is you know in terms of this whole pandemic situation um we were sort of limited in our creativity and and rick always found a way to get all these kind of CrossFit elements into his yeah. workouts. And he found a way to get real creative and, and real intense. And I always looked up to him for that kind of thing. Uh, but it's important that the big takeaway here is that like, we all considered it such a huge priority for our mental health. I mean, physical health, sure, staying awake, being alert, but just mentally you feel so much better exercising. And we were limited to doing it every other day uh, for, a, you know, a restricted amount of time. So in this situation, making just a little bit of exercise a priority is huge, huge thing. Yeah. And, and Rick, too, I mean, he was, uh, you know, more than happy to, to share ideas and stuff on different ways to, I mean, he, he wasn't keeping it all to himself. <laughs> is what I'm saying. Yeah. He, he was uh, more than happy to share his ideas and tips and stuff. So that, that really worked out well. That was my buddy Gary. If you remember him, Shelly, from the, the wedding, he, he wrote the, the workout program. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, that was that was all his stuff. I was always worried that the people on the video cameras watching us would just think I was too big of a weirdo <laughs> for doing all the uh, exercises. It wasn't from but, that, uh, Rick. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they had a lot of other evidence for that. Yeah. Uh, but like so, can, like, can I can I ask another question of the crew? Um, what what other ways did did you guys look out for each other? Like protecting people's time when they were gonna when they were training, or what? How are, how else did you look out for your teammates on this mission? I would say one key way, um, if if 
if there was a task that somebody had to do and they were either running a little bit behind or, or, uh, you know, were not really having a super great day, you know, we, we would try to cover for them. And, and we actually got in a little bit of uh, trouble for that. We got our wrist slap a little bit. Um, but we, you know, we continued to try to find ways to do things like that by helping each other with some of the various tasks and stuff. I think that was, that was one key way. Um, you know, I would say, you know, I, I think all four of us were pretty, cognizant of trying to read each other's uh moods and stuff and seeing how how we were doing and and if somebody just needed a little bit of more space that day I, I think you know the other three of us or the other two of us or whatever would try to back off a little bit and and we're pretty open with each other I mean you know I think probably all four of us at one point or another stated hey you know I just I just need some time you know, kind of by myself for a little bit and, and the other three would respect them. And yeah, I think it's amazing how, like, even in close quarters where you're, you know, sitting four feet away from someone else, you can still, I mean, have this, you can still have a sense of privacy in a way. Yep. Where, mm -hmm. you know, we were literally like sitting two, three, four feet away from each other, but it, it's almost like we had this gentleman's agreement, sort of unspoken, where if I'm not looking at you, then I can't see you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or if you have your headphones on, then I'm not allowed to talk to you, you know? And so, um, and then we we each sort of claimed like a chair, right? Like we, we each sort of like had different spaces and we didn't always sit there, but we each had like our little space and, and uh, and I had like my Arabic book, always in this one place. And so you kind of had like your own little area that was sort of yours after a while. And so it's amazing how your world can get fairly small um, if, if you just sort of respect each other's little bubble around you. And I, I don't want to give the impression like we were, <laughs> you know, always trying to get away from each other because in general I think yeah I think all four of us got along really well and we you know whether if we had tasks going on throughout the day you know we tried to get together for the meals especially the evening time you know we'd oh. get our supper together and you know we would have a show or something like that that we'd be watching together and and uh you know I for me I, those were some of my favorite times I thought you know and we'd sit around and joke around Quite a bit and watch twins baseball <laughs> so. from 1991 <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's, it's kind of like what we have to do now <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but it, but you no know sports we spent, we spent a lot of time together like way more than we had to when you think about it so so our habitat was uh two and a half stories and then we even had like two sort of separate air, like we had um we so we had a we had our the first floor was the, the laboratory workspace. And then the second floor was like our living room slash kitchen slash workout space. And then the, the, the third half story on the, on the third floor was our individual sleep bunks, which we weren't allowed in um, except when we were sleeping. But then jutting off the first floor, we had what we called the airlock. And then we also had the bathroom. So, you know, there was space to get away from each other, but it was amazing how much the four of us would always like stay together. Like we spent a lot of time hanging out together when we really didn't need to. Like we could have gone and sat by ourselves, you know, in the airlock. And every once in a while, maybe we did, but we did it very rarely when you think about it. We spent a lot of time together. Yeah, I can remember being in the airlock twice and really enjoying it when I needed a break, but I, two times in 23 days, mm -hmm. like we were together. And like, and that's something I try to tell people, like to carve team time, like together to do something, play a game, do something, but also carve out your time by yourself when you need it. But like that balance, like, you know, and I think, you know, what you guys are talking about, you know, we were open with each other. I mean, I think that even before we went in, in our training sessions, for the two weeks we had to get to know each other and meet each other, that we built a lot of trust. And from that trust, we were able to do, you know, you know what Shelly was talking about is like, we respected each other. 
and if somebody needed space, we gave it. If we could see if they needed it, if they weren't making eye contact, we, we respected that because we trusted that it, each other, there was an ill will. So we, you know, we knew that we trusted that whatever they were reporting back, they needed. And, you know, we asked for help. I remember all the time asking you guys for help when I would struggle with something and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm holding off on coffee today, man. I'm hurting. I'm hurting, man. I, I, I'm stuck right now. Like, I need help. Can somebody help me with this? And, you know, I knew I could trust you guys. And, you know, you guys helped carry me at times and, and, and help that balance, um, you know, through that. And that was, that helped me. And that was, that was really impressive the way that you guys banned it. We never really talked about that before the mission started. You guys just built a good vibe. Well, how important is it to to share that with with your teammates? Because sometimes those things aren't said, and they're, you know, you're just kind of expecting people to understand. Hey, I need some time alone. I need some, you know, I need this or I need that without actually communicating that using your words. How important is that to use your words when you're in a team environment? I I would say it it depends. <laughs> I mean it depends that you know on the personalities and the people if, if people are I think in general we um, read each other fairly well however there's probably definitely some times where we should have communicated with words more than we did and uh, um, <laughs> yeah so I don't, I don't know that's kind of a tricky question you know it's kind of you know for me I think I tend to assume I I am uh, understanding somebody and so a lot of times they tend to not communicate and I've that's probably not a good thing I mean I've, I've gotten into I've uh, misassumed things before by doing that so it probably always is okay to <laughs> verbalize things right how, how, I mean as the leader um, I mean do you do you do you think like if he's got a problem he's gonna say something right or or are you proactively reaching out and saying, Hey, is everything cool? Can I help you? What do you need? Or, uh, or are you kind of on that side where, Hey, if you had a problem, you'd say something. Uh, there was a cup. So it was different for different situations. Um, so sometimes, you know, I assumed that people would talk a couple times. I mean, you know, I was just a, a venting board, right. And which is important as well. I think, you know, so people can vent and get, blow some steam off. Um, you know, there, there was a, one time, uh, I think there was a, there was an issue with our communication. Um, so w about once every seven to 10 days, we could talk to uh, outside family members or friends. And there was a snafu on the mission control side. And, you know, and so, so then we just talked about it as a team at the end of the day, you know, after our tasks were done and we just, you know, addressed it and talked about it then. And it's so I, I think it really depends on the situation. You know, it's not really probably the answer you're looking for, but it it really I think depends on the situation, depends on the people. Um, I, I I don't know, Rick. You probably know a whole lot more about <laughs> this topic than somebody like I do. But you know, and Shelly and Reinhold, you guys have a lot different experiences too. But you, you brought up something that I, that we haven't talked about yet, which was um, our, our phone a friend lifelines. So um, most of the time, our only uh, lifeline to the outside world was our mission control. And we talked about that and radioing in with them. But they did um, every maybe about like roughly once a week or so, we had, what was it, 20 minutes to go into that private airlock area and um, talk to our friends and family members. And, um, and so they were, were given a set time, you know, to, you know, call Shelly on, you know, September 23rd at 2, 10 PM. And, um, and they would call in and then we could talk to them. And so it was a chance to just sort of, um, for me, it was a chance to just sort of reset and, um, just, you know, hear from my family and friends. And, um, that's something that I have found really useful for me during this current situation was um, my colleagues and I, we have a virtual happy hour every Friday at 5 p.m. And so we all uh, we all get on uh, FaceTime because we all have iPhones 
and we just, you know, hang out and talk to each other. And then another um, sort of my my non-work friends and I, we have set something up for, you know, every Saturday at 8 p.m. And um, and that's really cool, too, just to it, it's really it's helpful for me to know that it's on my schedule. Like I even put it on my schedule just so I see it, you know, and just so that it kind of like marks the time for me. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about in preparation for talking about this, so when, so at the time that I was doing Hera, I was, I was single. And so I didn't have like, um, a set person, like a, a significant other to be like the one person that would always call in and, you know, I'm close with my family members, but you know, they've got their lives too, you know? And so what I ended up doing was I gave those contact details, like my schedule times by, you know, like Saturday, the 27th on 2 PM to like 10 different people, because I knew that not all of them would be able to call in at any given time. And so every time that happened, I never knew who was gonna be calling in for me. And so like, I remember one time it was my work colleague and my two teenage nieces. Um, and another time it was my best friend and um, you know another family member. So it was like these weird, unique groups of people that would suddenly all be on the same party line with me. And I found that really helpful because you know it's amazing how someone doesn't have to be your like best friend in the world, like your significant other, your person, in order to give you uh, the help you need on any given day. So, you know, even someone who's just like your coworker, you know, not your best friend, not your significant other, but, you know, can can call in and, and give you that little lift you need. And then maybe you don't talk to them again for like another three weeks. But it's amazing how like just um, just like a little bit of interaction with a fairly disparate group of people can really give you uh, that boost you need. And then it makes you realize how you can give other people a little boost, even though you may not be their best friend in the world. But, you know, just coming into contact with you and hearing you talk about, like, the silly thing your cat did that, that day <laughs> might be just what they needed to, like, get themselves back in the headspace they need. So that's one thing I've been trying to keep in mind um, during this whole pandemic craziness was... Um, you know, the, the little bit of contact you might have with other people, even if they are sometimes even just minor characters in your life, can really make a difference to them. And so, um, you know, just kind of keep that in mind. We had, um, you know, in, in the wrestling world, you know, this is a lot of the people who watch this, they, they cancel or they postpone the Olympics that were just mm -hmm. about to happen. They had been training for for four years. Yeah. So think of something you've been training for for four years. And then they delay that this past March. Um, and then there's a lot of guys in college, seniors who lost uh, their NCAA championship opportunities too, and lots of sports beyond wrestling. So, like when you say that, there's guys I think it reminds me who could be struggling, you know, like with frustration, and they're out there now cooped up by themselves, not really allowed to exercise all that much when they're used to doing so at a world class level three times a day. And it might be helpful for them to have that contact people reaching out to them or them reach out to other people to have that support of like you know with whatever they need just conversationally um you know what was it like in russia reinhold i know that you guys had different exercise and positions but you you told a story once i think at the the talk you gave at nasa in january about some exercise program that you guys did as a team that the cosmonaut instilled some sort of requirement before you ate or something? Uh, I would say in general, I, I'm not a very good leader. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not a, probably the typical, uh, uh, you know, a type personality. I tend to lead a little more from behind maybe, or, you know, I, I tend to trust my team pretty well until, or unless they prove otherwise. <laughs> Um, so if I'm working on a project, for example, you know, I, I trust that they're going to get the job done and do what's appropriate. And I try not to interfere with them because I figure they they know more about what they're supposed to be doing than than what I do. Um, and so as long as I don't get in their way and I can help out by maybe being a roadblock for other distraction for them, that's that's a big win for me. Um, um, so I, and I kind of. You know, so the way I became a commander on this, I, I don't, 
they essentially drew names out of a hat, by the way. So, so for all four of our positions, they drew names out of a hat, and I happened to be uh, the commander. So, um, so that, that's how that came about. But, but I approached it kind of the same way. I mean, you know, there's micromanagers and and macro managers, and I figured these these three folks are higher performers than I am. So, I didn't really have much uh, much business getting into their business. Um, they they knew what they were doing and and for me I tried just to be a roadblock for if there were issues from uh, Mission Control or if there was um, you know uh, any type of roadblock I mean essentially I, what I tried to do was to um, stay out of their way as much as I could and uh, and and be a roadblock um, really the only <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I, I did I didn't have to do much at all. The, the other three guys on the team, um, and girls. So I mean, I meant the other three people on the team were, you know, extremely, extremely well motivated, extremely um, competent. Um, there was nothing for me to do really. So. Okay. Okay. I mean, I mean, it sounds it sounds similar to you know, what, what I deal with. I mean, it's, it's like, how can I, how can I help? How can I serve? Is, is there something I can get out of your way? Um, and is there something I can help you with, but we've got professionals and I'm going to let you guys do your job. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Essentially. I mean, you know, it's, um, (laughs) you know, a lot of times, uh, you get unwanted help from leaders or managers and I was, trying to not be that unwanted help so Ronald, i was asking him because we were talking about teamwork and exercise and i said that you had told the story when you gave a talk at nasa in january about some team integration of exercise that the cosmonaut who is the the commander of your mission what did he do to kind of do that team building and that exercise regiment that you guys was it like like a pass to get food or something like how did something like what was going on I, don't, I, I think ultimately it was it was just a team building kind of thing just something that would bring us together um right before the meal i, I don't know if it had any physiological uh, benefit but we would do uh planks we had a in the living room we had a big uh, foam mat there and and it was big enough for all uh all of us to get on so we do we started i think at like a minute or a minute and a half um just a straight plank and then i think by the end of the mission we were up to i don't know four four and a half minutes which was the most some of them had ever done by a long shot uh, <laughs> and then afterwards um our flight engineer and, and one of the mission specialists would do push-ups so dasha flight engineer would do push-ups afterwards and, and alan would help her um she started, I think, at maybe 10 or 12, and by the end of the mission, she was up to almost 30, um, which is the most she had ever done in her life, But uh, as, as far as I can remember. But I think the point was to, to just bring us together because the habitat was a lot bigger than Hera, and so oftentimes we'd be scattered around before meals for hours at a time and not really see each other. So this was a way to bring us together, and then, um, of course, we'd be together while we ate. Uh, a little extra time, I think, was the point. Also, keep us in decent shape. Uh, the core, keep the core going. You know. <laughs> so what was so it like? Did, Go ahead, Paul. Oh, I was just gonna ask. Did, did you feel that was kind of the best team building building activity you guys did, Reinhold? Or were there were there other things you guys did for team unity? Yeah, that was. Aside from eating together, that was. Hmm. Pretty much the only, you know, the only time I can really think of that we were all together in the same spot um, that close. We also, uh, we kind of like in Hera, we'd watch a show um, in the evenings uh, together um, just before bed. And then otherwise, the only time we really were all in the same place at once was when we were doing something like, uh, the listeners don't know, but one of the activities was Project Red, where we all you know, <laughs> ran our laptops together uh, in one spot. And then when we did um, cargo resupply uh, dockings, when we had to unload all the cargo from the supply sh- ship, uh, 
uh, that's when we were together. But the, the planks was cool because it's kind of the, the whole, you know, shared misery kind of mm-hmm. thing. And you build a bond that way. And, and all of us would just sit there and it got harder and harder throughout the mission as the strength fell off. Some people got stronger. Uh, but uh, that shared misery was nice. Suffering together is is important. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, Matt. You probably have a lot of that. Where you you guys have some most intense workouts, known to man. I'm guessing. Yeah. And those guys <laughs> must bond like crazy over that sort of that sh- shared pain. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's why I thought that when you were talking about that, I was thinking. Yeah, our guys do all kinds of stuff like that together, and who who can sit in the sauna the longest, and who, you know whatever the the situation yeah. is. Matt, what was the story you told about when you had to make weight for the Olympic trials on 24 hours notice, and they they kept you in the sauna? You said they beat the living hell out of you. Um, that was a little di- that was a little different situation. Normally, I wouldn't have been nine and a half kilos over my competitive weight, but. I was uh, I I'd won a court case and I was unaware that I was going to get what I'd asked for in a 24 hour notice. So it was like, okay, you got wow. what you want, but do it. But in 24 hours, you got to make the weight class. So th- those were those were actually my friends trying to help me. <laughs> they were they were they were concerned. You know, at one point. Uh, one or the other would be like, okay, he's going to die. Let's stop. Let's stop. Pull the plug. No, he can go longer. And then they would switch roles back and forth. The other guy would be like, you're right. He is going to die. No, no, I think he can go. <laughs> so, but yeah, that was, that was the was nine and a half kilos in 24 hours. So how key was that to have that, those guys kind of going back? I mean, one guy kind of encouraging you and one kind of, you know, looking out for your, well, be. Yeah. <laughs> it was great because, you know, I, I do they I do they both cared. I remember some team building stuff we did in our mission that I don't know that you guys even know maybe the impact that it had, at least for me. It was I found it really helpful. Um, there, there are two things that, that I wrote down that, that came to mind. Um, one of them was like an explicit team building task that we had to do that I think. So a lot of the th- exercises that we had to do as crew members, a lot of them at times seemed kind of cheesy, and we didn't know always mm-hmm. know why yeah. they were doing it. You know, there's your normal kind of stuff. And so I think we, we were doing some of those kind of team building, ice breaking things that maybe might be easy to roll eyes at at times. And there was a, a, a thing where I think there was a task we had to all go around and share what we liked about each other. And I thought it was totally hokey and cheesy. And I was probably the first to scoff at it, like in my mind on the inside. And I was like, all right, (laughs) we're going to do this. Right. But like, I was totally floored when like, after having done it, I was how good I felt about all of you guys. And I was like, wow, this really, really helped to like, to know what the other people think as Paul talked earlier about, you know, his leadership style uh, in, that sometimes you don't say always what is on your mind because you just think other people know things. And so it was like, wow, you know, we don't always tell people why they matter to us or why we care about them, Mm. our favorite parts about them. And going through that exercise for me was really helpful because, and and to me, it just, it built a lot of bonds and respect for you guys and, you know, helped me to go through hard times too. And uh, so that, being able to, you know, have that openness and, and share with other people that kind of honesty uh, that we don't always, I mean, who does that? It was like, hey, you know what I really like about you is this, that's not our normal everyday kind of thing, but, <laughs> um, but it's good. Maybe it ought to be at times. And, mm-hmm. you know, and the other thing that I found was a, a big, certainly like team building thing for me, but on accident this time, it wasn't an intentional exercise, but when people kind of spoke up to help unrequested. And so um, you guys might remember this situation, but, but we had a situation where I was in a little bit of hot water with mission control. They, they were <laughs> mad at me. I, I had kind of a crappy situation and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, so you know. And, they do remember. 
Okay, so <laughs> I was a little bit of hot water. It was like I said, it was it was just kind of a kind of a crappy situation. And we were at the end of like a two to three operation that we were doing in, in virtual reality with uh, spacewalks and stuff. And for for our mission, these spacewalks <laughs> were intense. They were like the big thing you did every day. It was a big deal. And when you live in a 600 square foot thing with people and you get a chance to go out in a virtual world and explore an asteroid or a thing, like that's a big deal in your day because that's your escape and it's awesome. We just finished, we retired and and I got some messages from mission control that got shut up the brass <laughs> to the top of the flagpole at NASA and right back down. And it was, my, my rear was in trouble. And they wiped, and so, wiped the floor with you. They definitely wiped the floor with me. And so the reason I mentioned this story is because in the middle of that, and we had just done a three-hour operation. That was one of our longest ops. It was about two to three hours. And we had a lot of communication going back and forth in, in virtual reality between all of our positions. We all had to work together. Some things worked. Some things didn't. I don't even remember if we were happy or sad with each other at the time. But the <laughs> when we were done, we opened our messages. We got this. And... Shelly, without me even asking about it, like you s popped off this email to them on something that I was in trouble on, and you could have totally like kicked me under the bus and like flushed you down the on, toilet. You could have totally just flushed me right down, and but you didn't, and you took the initiative just on your own right, and, and that that made me feel so good to just know that I, you know. I always knew I could trust you guys, but like to have something in real life happen where you really are in trouble about something when somebody stands up and shows that like, holy crap, like you can trust me. Like I, without being asked. Yeah. And, and you said, Hey, no, this isn't what happened. This and this and this, you know, and, and you, and that in itself to me was such a team building experience that was organic though. Um, and, and I, I mean, I thank you for that again. Like, and, like it, it really meant a lot and it, you know, um, so I think, you know, Matt, to your questions, those are two things. One was an outside, ex like an external exercise that was designed and other times it has to happen organically, but you have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to, to offer that sort of, um, you know, unsolicited. Shelly took that initiative on herself and that built trust and that built rapport to me, those are two important elements. Very nice. Well, I don't want to take up any more of everybody's time here, but I just wanted to, if anybody wanted to say anything else uh, before, and I just want to thank everybody for coming on here. What a what a treat to have just this crew and and historic. You know, no one no one's ever done this before gotten the whole crew back together so i'm glad i could be a part of it thank you <laughs> and uh if anybody's got any last last messages for us um i'd love to hear them i i would say what one of the key things i, I think was humor and uh i mean that was, honestly that lightened the mood and that was a huge deal okay. and Wil wilson agreed yeah oh, and uh <laughs> i think awesome. keeping humor and just joking around and enjoying each other was huge and it it honestly it i don't want to say it was easy but but it it was pretty easy <laughs> the quote i mean it was it was a fun time so thank you paul yeah i thought that the humor was important like we had i hope wilson up here because that was kind of our we adopted mascot for our mission you know in confinement kind of like castaway and we made him kind of a team member and and it was one of our running jokes. So, like, if people, you know, if you're confined in your apartment, your house, or whatever, like, get whatever running jokes you guys got. Like, keep that. That'll be special within your within your group, and that that'll help you guys to bond over stuff when you're anxious. When you have, oh hey, I'll say hi. Hi. And I, I just think it's great for us all to be together again. And it's it's too bad it took a global pandemic to to. I mean, we could have been doing this all the time. So I would say to everyone out there who's listening to, you know, think of like your, your old friends from high school or, you know, from, from some other time in your life and reach out to them and, and do a Skype session. Uh, Cause you know, you guys all have the time to do it and it, it'll be amazing how great you'll feel afterwards. Cause I feel great right now after having seen you guys like this, it's really cool. We need to do it again when we, uh, when we don't have to socially distance.
Exactly. Yeah. We we need to do it in person, right? In person, yeah. yeah Six feet some, apart. Yeah. Some real crap. Definitely. Tasting. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, no Reinhold, Ryan, I have legitimate Reinhold, questions for you. Do you have some more questions for him? Yeah, I have legitimate questions, man. Like, I want to pick your brain, oh, no. dude. Like, 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 if you have a chance to speak to the nation that that sent you to Russia to represent us for four months, like everyone's about to look at it's people you've been talking about a couple months. Like, what does your expertise say? Hey, guys, this is what you're in store for. Hunker down, ex- plan for this, this, and this, and here's here's a couple tips to to get over a couple humps. Or like, what what should people expect when they go into this longer term thing that that none of us else here have, have done yet for that extended time. Well, I have to tackle what, what Paul was saying and what you were saying. And I think Shelly too is humor is a big one. Just the family, the friends, everyone just keep the humor going. Um, keep the physical activity going and try to get yourself a little bit better every day. 1% better, I think, if you can. Uh, and be ready to, to ride it out for the long haul. Uh, and and just be open to that and take it in stride and um, maybe get uh, grandma and, and your kids and your friends together on Skype and, and do a plank before every meal. You don't have to be near each other, but <laughs> I'm gonna start doing just that. be open to it. Yeah. <laughs> just what, be open to anything, you know? What's the biggest challenge they should be concerned about? I don't know. It's tough to say. I think, uh, Looking out for yourself physically, you don't want to get into any sort of bad habits that you can't break over long term. So, you know, alcohol and, and drugs, that kind of stuff, if you're prone to that, it's it's dangerous and it's dangerous territory, especially now when boredom sets in and that sort of thing. You just don't want to turn to something that might damage you long term, uh, All obviously in, in small doses uh alcohol and stuff is, is is not a big deal but you don't want you don't want to take it too far did they have good vodka in the mission <laughs> no vodka no nothing like that <laughs> <laughs> um we had some class but uh, uh i don't think anyone experienced any sort of uh altered state of mind from any of that <laughs> <laughs> so it- you know, the, the other thing I, th- I thought about, too, is, you know, coping strategies. So, like, we get a lot of, uh, you know, communications at Cal State as, as instructors to be mindful of our students who might be having struggles at home. They might be in households they, that they're confined to that might have, like, domestic abuse or, or other type of situations that they can't get out of where school is their refuge from. And so, like, you know, um, most of the time you guys weren't domestically abusing me in the mission most of the time time. (laughs) most of the time um paul was very mean though some other times um but uh you know think of the you know what do you i want to ask you guys individually like what are some coping strategies that you found during just the normal frustrations and conflicts that can just be normal in these times to get over those bumps i mean i know we talked about music i know shelly you you really su- surprised me with showing the, the the value that art can bring mm-hmm. and and the and that sort of therapeutic elements where like now i'm kind of taking some of your things i learned from you and like i'll do some art now little, like like what would you tell people um are some coping strategies that you guys individually found useful for me music is a big one so um you know, when we were it, at Hera, we had Amazon um, Amazon Unlimited Music. So, um, and we figured out a way to play it over a speaker. And so we always had music playing. Uh, so much I think Mission Control uh, thought that was annoying because they couldn't hear us as well as they wanted to. Um, but, uh, and, and we happened to play Amazon's classic rock station a lot. And now whenever I ask uh, Alexa to play that for me, I, I, I'm like transported back there and I think of you guys. So I'd recommend um, putting together like a, a, a COVID-19 <laughs> because you know, in two, three, 10 years, you're gonna hear that and be instantly transported back, maybe for better or worse. But, uh, but you know, maybe like make a, a different playlist each week. 
Um, and it'll be like almost like like an emotional diary, you know, to think about like, oh, well, the first week was like this, the second week was like that, and um, and and yeah, like for me, art is art is really important, and uh, you know, I've started sewing again, and um, I live in downtown DC, so I'll um, every so often I'll go out for a walk or a run along the um, you know the National Mall. And I've just been taking like a photo diary and I create like a photo album for myself on my computer. Um, and it's just interesting to see like how, you know, the crowds have dispersed, you know, completely and, um, and the seasons are st starting to change too. And so, you know, I think like the act of creation is really important. And so, I, you know, just think of something you could do, whether that's like cooking or, artwork or you know even just getting like some kids crayon it's coloring books like sometimes just like making something um or like model cars or you know just something that you can make i think gives you like a sense of satisfaction at the end like because you have a finished thing at the end that you could point to so to me i found i think that's been really helpful Uh, for me, I, I don't know, I struggle with it, this question. Um, so one of the coping mechanisms that were supposed to be there was not really, um, didn't really help. In fact, it was kind of a, it was a, both a, a positive and a negative. <laughs> and that was the personal calls that Shelly talked about earlier. So for me, you know, I, I, I think that I really enjoyed the time in here. I thought it was a blast. I thought the crew members were awesome. It, you know, it was, it was almost like a fun summer <laughs> summer camp vacation, except the personal calls. And the reason I say that is because um, it remind. I mean, the toughest part for me was be, I've got a bunch of little ankle biters <laughs> running around and and a wife and stuff. And 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 for me, it was tough. Um, not even necessarily being away from them, but knowing that it was hard for them. And so, and every time we had a personal call, it was a reminder of that. Um, so by far, that was the toughest for me. And I think that was supposed to be kind of a coping mechanism that they gave. And it was something that I couldn't, couldn't control and could do nothing about. Um, and so to be applicable for our current situation, I mean, I guess I would try to focus on things that you can control. <laughs> um, for me, that was that was an uncontrollable thing. There was nothing I could do about it, and it was really really difficult. Um, but um, the thing that I could, con for me, I guess the biggest coping mechanism that did work was relying on my teammates. And I mean, again, the, I mean, it it really wasn't tough at all because all three of the crewmates were. By that time, I'd become close friends, and I relied on them for my emotional support and mental support and physical support, and it made all the difference. And and back to your original question, Rick, it doesn't really help that matter if if you don't have that support at home. Um, you know, I guess the only the only thing I could think of to offer for advice would be to focus on on something that you can control, whether it's, um, you know, like some of Shelley's ideas were wonderful. And, uh, and you know, those are things that can be controlled and that you can work through and, and really put your focus onto and, and try to ignore the negative sides of things. Um, Reinhold, I, I don't know what you, you know, I know you cope very differently and, and uh, stuff. So I'd be curious what you had to say about that too. Just in, in regards to coping through Hera with the challenges? Yeah, well, yeah, Hera or your four month stint. I mean, how, what were some of the best coping mechanisms that you had for that? Especially, I think, if, uh, uh, especially what? Well, I mean, you know, especially in light of if it's, uh, you know, if, if school generally is a, an escape for you and because you don't, you know, maybe you have an abusive home environment or something like that so yeah it is, it's a tough way tough one to answer um Hera and, and Sirius I think it just you always try to look for opportunities to grow somehow and 
mm-hmm. if it means getting a chance to work on a relationship um, that's been struggling, then there's an opportunity there, then take advantage of it and and go for it, even if it's difficult to be the one to initiate that. Um, in certain situations that you, you want to get away from, uh, just trying to find a silver lining somehow, some way, that it, and it's difficult to give sort of a... a, a one sentence answer i guess for all situations but just continually searching for some silver lining i would say well on a, on a positive note i have my my, my last question for, for paul is because you have all this other experience uh not just flying hundreds of hours in these fighter jets with astronauts <laughs> and for for years but you worked as an operations engineer for Harrow too, so you don't just know this team. You've watched lots of teams after us, and you've you've been the big brother on the camera watching them. Train. <laughs> and so my question is, among all those various experiences, from the astronauts to all the Harrow crews, what are there one are there one or two or three things that stand out for you that you've noticed over time? are markers of good teams or one or two things that stand out over those observations of things that became red flags to you were like, yeah, this one's probably not going to work out real well. This is going to be an issue. Oh man, that's, that's a loaded question. I mean, well, and probably an easy one for red flags of ones that are not going to work out or, you know, if somebody had a, was approach, approaching that as a from a selfish point of view, right? You know, if there was, if their emphasis was not on the team, if the emphasis was on themselves instead. Um, I can't think of a single time that ever worked out. Um, you know that. In fact, I mean, those were the worst teams that I saw. Were the ones that um, where there was some one or two or whatever of the people that were. That, you know, we're not looking out for the best interests of the team. Um, for, you know, some positive one, I mean, it's kind of the same things that we've been talking about here. You know, it's been been the folks that have had positive attitudes are always looking uh, for the silver lining, as Ryan Holt said. They're always, they're encouraging each other and cheering each other on and, and you know, they're, they're the guys that were in the sauna with Matt, um, you know, encouraging them to keep on going, you know, when, when you're at your breaking point, I mean, those are, those are the teams that work, you know, and that's why our team was so successful. I mean, you know, it, I don't, I'm obviously I'm biased, but you know, I, thought, I thought our team was one of the most successful ones that, that I've seen. And it's because of all these things that we've been talking about. I think he yeah, said it best. I remember thinking at one point, oh my gosh, like when the when the sleep deprivation had really hit in and we were like super busy doing something and the you know the emergency alarms were going off. I remember thinking like I don't know if I could do this if I was doing it by <laughs> myself. Like even if I had all the space I wanted and um, you know I, like I don't know if I could have done it without you guys because there was something about us all having a shared mission where we were all working towards the same goal and that meant that we all knew what each other needed at any given time so like even like little things where like we would know that oh you know rick is doing this uh you know this this maneuver right now which is what i did three hours ago and when i did it I was out of batteries, and so he can be out of batteries. So, Rick, here are your batteries so that you don't have to come all the way upstairs to get them. Like, you know, people do that for each other. There'd be times where I would be doing something and my batteries would be out, and then I would just like turn and like a foot away would be like a new set of batteries that one of you guys just found, like knew that I was going to need them, and so just had them there for me. You know, it's like little things like that, which because we were all doing the same thing, working for the same mission, like we knew what each other's needs were gonna be because they were our needs too. So I just found that to be really, really helpful. 
Well, I found you guys to be super helpful uh, across everything. I can't thank you guys enough for not just doing this show today, but for, for everything you did, helping helping the mission to succeed and helping me to succeed the mission. Picked me up from the ground when I was dragging. And uh, you guys helped me to grow to be a, a better person. And uh, I feel better for it, just having known you guys and get to spend the time with you. Same here. I look, to, look up to all you guys. Uh, it's been awesome getting to know you. And it's, it's too bad we're so far apart. But... Thank yeah. you for coming on and, and doing this historic event uh, and sharing sharing your insight. And I've got some good lessons and I'm going to put notes and get this show posted.